Hello, I think we are live. Is this going out live? It is indeed. And I can see that there are some people online. Well, welcome to my kitchen studio in, in London. My name is and today I'm going to talk to you about some of the work I do in conservation, but specifically talking to you about rhinos. And as you can see behind me, I have a couple of photo props from the wild, and I've got some little animals joining me who are going to help me with some of the discussions, and one complete random one, which is a shark. <laughs> So I think here we are, 1600, and we are good to go with the lesson. So I'm James Glancy, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background first. Um, what I do with a conservation charity, Veterans for Wildlife, the work we do around the world. And then I'm just going to just go through some rhino facts, what's going on in the world uh, and the species of rhinos. And then towards the end, we'll really uh, to get involved in conservation and of course, to support rhinos. So my passion for wildlife probably began I mean, at a really young age. I love dinosaurs, sharks, all the animals you can ever imagine. I think it really, I was really changed when I learned to dive when I was 13. I think it was on my fifth paddy open water dive. And I'd only just had my birthday, so I'd only been just, just allowed to dive at 13, 14 years old. And uh, there were sharks in the water. And I, I'd always, kids love sharks and I still do, but see bull sharks, something that you should automatically make you fear them. I, for some reason, was more mesmerized and swimming towards them, having to be held back by my dad. And when I came back from that trip, I just bought every single shark book I possibly could. And he was just the coolest dude ever. So this was in Florida. And I thought when I grow up, grow up, I want to be a British Navy SEAL who dies with sharks and does adventures with animals because that sounds really cool. So I kind of did that. And I guess 20 years later, um, I did join the British Royal Marines. I did become a specialist diver. And all those skill sets I've, I've learned uh, in the military have now put into practice in the conservation world and I work for a charity called Veterans for Wildlife. Veterans for Wildlife, that's what it says on the tin, really. We are former military, police, paramedics, uh, and we go around the world uh, where we're invited into countries where they have problems with poaching, where animals, um, their numbers are declining. And we help local communities um, where the animals have been taken by poachers, which is something I'm gonna come, in, come along into later. Um, it can be very dangerous and these people live in great risk in the bush, in the jungle, in the savannas, all across amazing landscapes. But they need skill sets to survive and sometimes they come face to face with poachers who are trying to kill these animals and they're armed. So we help those people um, get the best skills possible so that they can look after these magni magnis magnificent species. But first of all, I've got a question, and I'm going to come back at the end. And I really want you guys not to Google this. So I, I can see questions rolling in straight away. My question is, I, and you can start putting your answers in, but I'm going to pick, pick this up at the end. So behind me, there are two types. All of you watching right now, right now already know what those types of rhinos are. But what I want you to tell me, okay, so we are, are, you know we've got here, we've got the black rhino and we've got a white rhino here. But what is the main, most distinguishing difference between those two types of rhinos? So you can start putting your questions, but please don't Google it. If you know, you know. If not, we're going to talk a little bit more about those differences. So I've, uh, Lizzie has asked me to give a story, a wildlife story. And I've told you how I've got into conservation and a bit of my, about my background, um, what veterans wildlife do. Well, it has to be a rhino story. And it begins in 2018 in KwaZulu in town. I was working with a conservationist, famous guy called Grant Folds, whose family have a, a very new, new um, used to be a poacher. 
poaching for bush meat uh, and, and different animals in the bush, in the bush vet in South Africa, around KwaZulu Natal. And he has spent all his life in the wilderness with animals. And he was out poaching one day and had this experience looking at a crash of rhinos where he just suddenly felt completely in love with the animals and no longer wanted to kill them. And that epiphany he had turned him from a poacher into a ranger who protects them. Now, Nunu is an incredibly gifted, amazing man. And he took me out on foot in in Kuzulunata, in a reserve, and in Filozi Shishlui, took me out on foot into the reserve. Rhinos, these guys here. And we went out just before sunset, found a mother and her calf, and this little baby boy rhino, he must have been about six months old. And you think ordinarily, well, you know, wild rhino, this thing is two and a half tons of animal. And we just sat in the grass, and mother and baby just walked around us and ate the grass like little lawnmowers around us so gently and the little boy cheeky looking at us um he fascinated wanted to get closer his mum was nudging him keeping him back and you you just realize what a delicate amazing animal uh, rhinos are but it's also that delicate uh soft nature that makes them so easy to be poached because it's quite easy to walk up with them but that was a transformative I'm back, Nunu. Uh, we made a, a short film last November, which is uh, which you can find on my Twitter and YouTube pages, um, and as on my Instagram, uh, pinned up. And it's called the Rhino Whisperer, and you just see how connected with nature Nunu is. And on that day, we went out. It was absolutely. It was raining really, really hard. And I didn't, I thought it was going to be sunny. I didn't take any warm clothes. So I had to borrow some of his. I was in shorts and I was just absolutely freezing. But it's a nice video and it just shows you the nature of these animals and a meeting of a crash of rhinos was absolutely extraordinary. So that was my, that's my favorite rhino story. So well, walking with wild rhinos. And you can do this yourself if you go to South Africa. Nunu can do that. So let's um, talk about. It's a bit of a sort of a teach about, you know, what have we got on planet Earth in terms of rhinos? Well, there are five species of rhinos. Two of those um, are in the continent of Africa and three in Asia. And they, all species of rhinos are in decline, unfortunately. Around 1900 in Africa, estimated to be around half, half a million rhinos. Today, there are around 20,000 um, white rhinos and about 5,500 black rhinos. So if you think of that decline, it's way more than 95%. And what has happened, um, the reason for that um, comes down to overpopulation, rise of humanity across Africa means that uh, we've put Push them out there. Rhino horn poaching. I'm going to come on to specifically in a bit, but they, the, the the space that they have to roam has been encroached upon by humanity. Farming, settlements, hunting, and then of course climate change has changed um, the habitats and uh, the food that they eat um, to the point where we have pushed most of these, all all of these species to extinction. And within those rhinos, those two types of rhinos, the black and the white, there are subspecies, um, some of which are extinct, others that are on the brink. Now, my speciality, um, the ones I know about and the ones I work with are actually the African species. Uh, but of course, there are um, three Asian ones. And I'm just going to run through some facts on the Asian ones because um, I know less about them, but it's it's really important to, to understand just what we're talking about in, in terms of of none that are left. So of the three apes, the Sumatran, which is the smallest, there are less than 100 left in the wild. In the wild. You know, we are talking critically endangered. That's that not just in our lifetimes, 
but potentially in the next five to 10 years, those, those rhinos could be gone. So conservation measures to support them are absolutely uh, critical. Uh, the Javan rhino, they know how many there are, there's 72. Uh, and they have been dying. They're, they're, of course, they're, there are breeding programs, but they're just 72. The Indian rhino um, is three and a half, about 3,000, three and a half, 3,400. Um, there has been some success in growing the numbers of the one horned Indian rhino, but three and a half thousand really, if you think of the size, the continent, or from India all the way up to Nepal, what a large area that is, that, that, that number is still really, really low. The numbers there um, still are not great. Why rhinos between, I've seen two, two figures actually, 20,000, 18,000. Uh, the white rhino, this guy here, that's the that's number that there are still the, um, the, the largest number. However, there are two subspecies of rhinos and you'll be aware that um, last year, um, the last male white rhino um, died and that was the northern white rhino. There are two females left at Old, Old Pegeta Reserve in uh, Kenya. There is talk that there are some still in some roaming in South Sudan, but it's, you know, if there are, the numbers are low, but they are considered functionally extinct. The good news is, and where science comes in, is that there are embryo pro programs there are trying to that they they preserve the eggs from some of the the females with and there may be possibility in the future through artificial insemination to recreate the northern white rhino in a southern white rhino host but you know the hope that's still um, a pretty bleak outlook however however the numbers of white rhinos are stable and that is the result of excellent conservation work communities in south africa where the white rhinos are most numerous so I just got num I've got some, I uh, can see the questions rolling on already, but communities where southern white rhinos are, um, so the white rhinos um, are most numerous in, in uh, South Africa, are making huge steps to looking after um, these species. And um, the numbers have been ste steady. So in South Africa um, last year, the, there was around 1,100 poached in the wild. This year, the numbers are down. In fact, the peak was already full. So what's happened as a result of good conservation work is the, uh, the numbers of poaching has gone down. So I, I, said, I said I was going to speak to you about poaching. In fact, I'm going to finish off one thing on the black rhino because I recently just came back from Cameroon. I was in Cameroon with Veterans for Wildlife training rangers in Jar Reserve. And what I didn't realise until I went there was that there was a, spe there was a subspecies of the black rhino. Um, that, that lived in Cameroon, which is the, we the Western black rhino. And that became functionally extinct there in 2011. It's in a within touching distance. It wasn't that long ago. And of the other subspecies, the Eastern black rhino, there are less than 700 in the wild. But there's good news on that. Um, breeding programs, which you can, you can get involved and you can support across Europe, in zoos across Europe, are actually... Um, coming out and um, in Folly Farm in Wales they have just had a baby a black, an eastern black rhino baby boy and what is happening um, with the um, black rhino is these breeding programs it's not just about having cute babies so um, they can go into zoos it's about rewilding them and reintroducing them back into their natural habitat and last year four four rhinos were, were reintroduced into Rwanda and three of those are, have successfully integrated and are doing well. Bear in mind, um, Rwanda has been rhino-less for some time. So why is this? Why have we seen such a huge decline in these amazing species? Well, I talked about habitat reduction, um, but this is human wildlife conflict. The elite trade is the reason we are sat at home isolated. It comes down to our relationship with wildlife and the exploitation of animals. The reason we have coronavirus is because of the poor conditions in wet food markets, because of bush meat, because of eating live species. Uh, and that's the same with Ebola and SARS, the other pandemics that we had over the last 10 years. So 
when we talk about um, the legal wildlife trade, we're talking about an industry worldwide, which is on the black market worth about 23 to 24 billion. It's only um, slightly below, uh, well, it's just below um, human trafficking and it's just below uh, uh, the trade in narcotics and weapons. So it's a huge, huge is for their horn. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are shouting your screens saying, you know what this is made of. Well, it, and you're right to say it is made of keratin. And keratin is the same thing in our fingernails and in our hair, which I wish I had a little bit more of these days. But keratin, um, it grows, if you cut the horn off, it grows again. But it is believed um, in Asian medicine, specifically in Asia, but in China as well, that um, keratin ground up can be used as an aphrodisiac uh, and it can treat different types of illnesses. Um, worst of all right now, it's believed that keratin can be used to treat fever, which is really bad news. And I'm not quite sure how coronavirus is affecting the rhino horn um, underground. my fears about because if it's believed to treat a fever then this is going to be in demand right now but what i can tell you and what science tells us is that keratin your fingernails has no medical properties whatsoever it doesn't help treat fevers it doesn't help you whatsoever so these animals have been slaughtered in their thousands for something that doesn't work um oh yeah there's one other use that they use it for um also in yemen and Oman is used uh, in, in the blades of daggers. And actually, we've got to admit that in the Western world ourselves, um, we're, we're not um, without blame. We have used products like ivory and rhino horn for centuries for ornaments. Uh, and so that's why it's so important in the United Kingdom that we shut down the antiques markets for ivory and for rhino horn. So I talked to you rhino because um, that's what I've been seeing lately. I didn't obviously see any in Cameroon, but there are four spe subspecies of uh, black rhino. And I've actually had to do, you know, I've done a bit of learning myself um, over the last couple of days for this. I, I knew quite a lot about the Eastern black. I, I, I hadn't heard of the Western black rhino until I went to Cameroon a few weeks ago. But there is also um, the West, uh, sorry, the Southwestern and the South Central black rhino and one known as the Ketlaos, the South African black rhino. There's four subspecies um, of black rhino. But within that one group, there are only five and a half thousand in the wild. So the numbers are really, really low. Now rhinos have no natural predators in the wild. Unless they're babies, they can be taken by lions or crocs. But when they're fully grown, we are talking about two and a half thousand kilos of animal Holding around the bush. Rhino, and a half kilos. This guy, black rhino, about 1800 kilos. Absolutely magnificent species. So the only predator that they have is us, is humans. So, what can we do? Well, at home, raising awareness. We've just got to keep telling the stories, educating people. The most important people that need, a uh, group that needs educating are people that are users of rhino and to understand that it has no medical properties. You can support charities um, like ours, Veterans for Wildlife, like Helping Rhino. Um, there are so many good charities that are doing work and their work involves outreach, education, um, involves supporting ranger initiatives who protect um, rhinos at reserves all across uh, their range in Southern Africa, uh, in Asia. But we can also just be more environmentally friendly and I'm gonna come back to some tips for that. Um, in the in fact, I'll get back to, to, to answer as well. But um, in fact, I'm going to go to come to tips now, actually. I've been thinking about we're stuck at home. It feels in my work with Veterans Wildlife, I can do nothing because my skill set is training rangers. And I've come back from Cameroon, places in lockdown. We've got friends and we've got work going on in Tanzania, in Namibia, in Zambia. Um, what use am I here? And I if you think about it, it's just reevaluating how we live, whether that's my own 
carbon footprint, whether it's what I use, how many of the items I have in my house that I use that I don't need that come from all around the world because I am using thing, too many single use plastics. How much food do I waste? Now you've seen all the runs on the supermarket. You see more um, resourceful because things have become so cheap and so readily available. Now they're not gonna affect the rhinos is that if we're taking resources from the round, one, around the world, whether it's hardwoods for our furniture, whether it's um, oil, whether it's um, food, or eating too much meat, we're reducing habitat. And habitat reduction is responsible for the reduction in wildlife, uh, the, redu the reduction in space. Because if you think of a creature like the rhino, eight, one and a half, three, three to four tons, that needs a lot of space. And if we're eating food, if we're um, wasting food, that's been produced somewhere. And the more people there are, there are on the planet, that means we're taking more food, more farmland, less space for nature. So at home, we can do better in our energy footprint and what we do. I think coronavirus is perhaps one of the biggest opportunities that we have ever had as humans to change our behavior to end the illegal wildlife trade. Now I know it is tough living at home, being isolated, and I know um, many of us will have loved ones that are affected, but I think is now, now is the time, better than any time before, to take action. We've got to now lobby our MPs, we've got to lobby everybody we can to be more responsible, to take the illegal wildlife trade seriously. So, answers to the questions. Do I have any experience with pangolin poaching? Pangolins live in like the Cameroon, yes. Um, people are taking, cam people are taking um, pangolins for food all the time and then their scales, they strip them off of them. Um, obviously, we think any news on Moana elephants, Lizeba Reserve? Not yet, so Moana is a reserve I'm working or creating reserve with Lizeba and sadly a friend died after being trampled by elephants. So dangerous work working with this big, these big animals. Um, I will send out a link about Lizeba and what's going on there. Right, pangolins, there's some real pangolin lovers here. What's my favorite type of rhino? White rhino, because you can just sit down and they, they, they graze around you. They're the most beautiful species. I love all rhinos, but white rhinos are just the most gentle creatures. Right, who else? We've had some things deleted here. I don't know what's been said. Right, I need to answer the question. And you're quite right here. Nose on the black rhino. So they, both rhinos use their lips to grab food, but this guy's like your lawnmower. He's a grazer. Um, they go around and they, they eat the grass. Whereas the black rhino, they're chomping um, at the branches, at the twigs. So they've got that special lip, lip, lip to, grab their, um, to grab the tree, the, the twig, and then pull it back into their mouth so they can munch on it because neither of them have teeth at the front. So one eats grass and has the flat lawnmower shaped mouth and the black rhino, which is also smaller. They're the same color, by the way. There's no difference in color. Um, it's, it's all down to mouth shape. So well done guys who got that right. Well, I'm afraid I have witted on for 25 minutes, which is three minutes longer than I should have done. And I could, you know, now I've got into my role, I could keep to my conservation, animals, rhinos. Um, there is so much, as I've said, some, you know, we're on the precipice of losing them. So we've got to do all we can to preserve them. I hope this has been informative. If you want to learn more, oh, I've gone. I've gone, apparently. We are trying to reconnect you. Well, here we go, back up. Sorry guys, it looked like there's a brief interlude there. I know a lot of people are online. But if you want to learn more, um, get in touch with Lizzie Daly and myself, and I'm happy to answer questions on my social media. I'm J at J A Glancy on Instagram, at J A Glancy on Twitter, and James Glancy Official on Facebook. Um, and I'd love for you to get involved with the charity conservation we do going forward. Thank you so much, Hold up. Siri. 
thank you so much for tuning in. And um, I haven't answered all the questions and I will endeavor to answer these afterwards. Thank you guys.